Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Dr Zoe Jacobs. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr Mike Clare for the final part of this two-part special all about plastics and the effects they have on our ocean. Hi Mike, thanks for joining us today. No Good to see you. Um, so before we get into the details, um, I thought it would be really great if you could tell us how you got into this line of work, because you didn't actually start your career in academia, did you? No, that's right. I mean, I, I did a geology degree originally and was really interested in mm. dinosaurs and volcanoes <laughs> and that sort of thing, I think, as ev every kid is. Um, then did the geology degree and, and kind of went looking for, for something to do. I was pretty adamant at the time I didn't want to do research at all. I, I wanted to go and get some, some experience doing something totally different. Um, so I ended up working for a, a company that did surveys and site investigations for all sorts of offshore infrastructure. So things like cables and pipelines, offshore oil and gas mm -hmm. and renewables. And so my background really was getting to grips with trying to understand the natural hazards that can impact those things. And, and the more I started looking into that, the more I realized we really don't know an awful lot about these processes and a whole load of other things that happen in the deep sea. Mm. Uh, and that got me interested. And then I started coming back to the scientific literature and getting mm -hmm. excited by things and then accidentally found myself coming back to the National Oceanography Center mm -hmm. to do a PhD um, ah. and very much focused on that area. So studying landslides, which can mm -hmm. be far bigger than those landslides that happen on land. And, and they happen for apparently unknown reasons. So okay. some, some of the biggest landslides on our planet happen on the sea floor. Uh, they can be bigger than the area of Scotland, for example, wow. and fail on slopes less than one degree. That's the, the, the angle of, uh, of a Premier League football pitch. Mm. So that sort of thing shouldn't fail on land, but it does under the sea. Yeah. Um, so that really kind of got me got me going and, and, and wanting yeah. to learn more about that sort of thing. That's cool. So that's interesting, actually. I'm not sure how many people have heard of kind of landslides under the sea. Because we know about, obviously, the landslides on land. Um, so... Why, why do we actually care about these kind of hazards under the sea then? What's the kind of societal implication? If so the societal implication, there's many. So the first thing links back to the job I was doing in industry. So at the moment, most people aren't aware, but more than 99% of all digital data traffic, that's the internet, it's mm -hmm. Facebook, it's Twitter, um, relies on submarine cables. About 1% yeah. goes via satellite. And these cables every so often break. Sometimes mm. it's to do mostly to do with human causes like fishing, but every so often multiple cables break. Um, and these are some of the first observations we ever had that these underwater landslides mm. happened. Cables were breaking hundreds of kilometres from wow. shore and breaking one after another. And we could then start to see that these, these huge landslides can happen. But the landslides can also displace the water on top of them. If they're very big, they, it's like throwing a big rock into a, a mm. big bathtub, they create tsunami waves right. as well. And, and so most tsunami are created by earthquakes, mm -hmm. but every so often they're created by landslides and they're quite unpredictable. We don't know mm. a lot about them, but obviously for coastal communities, there's a very big uh, impact potentially. Yeah, my gosh, that sounds it. Um, so moving on to um, the kind of main topic of this podcast, which, podcast, which is mic <laughs> microplastics. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, so can you tell us what we currently know about, um, about plastics getting transported into the ocean and, and across it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that kind of, it seems like a, a big leap from landslides to microplastics. Mm. But part of the thing that I study and I want to understand is, is how do sediments of sand and mud get mm -hmm. transported from land to the deep sea? Yeah. Um, and one thing that gets transported from the land to the deep sea is litter, pollutants. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, we're starting to see that tiny fragments and fibres that are maybe less than one millimetre in size, mm. microplastics are also getting transported. So I was discussing with colleagues and said, well, how important might the processes that we study on the deep sea actually be for transporting microplastics? There's, in the last 10 years, maybe been a really big increase in the number of people studying microplastics. Mm. And everywhere we go, we find them. They're found on the top of Mount Everest. They're being transported by winds. And in the ocean, there's, a, there's been a significant amount of work that has shown that surface currents, so waves and, and other things that, that drive currents, they, they can concentrate and focus microplastics and, and plastics of all sorts into different places, into these sort of tropical gyres. Um, and so they, they can concentrate them. And you've probably heard of things like the floating garbage patches yes. in the ocean that are mm. probably not actually a, like an island of plastic. It's mm -hmm. more like a plastic soup. But yeah. a significant amount of that is these bits, these tiny bits of plastic, microplastics. When people have started looking at how much plastic there is floating on the ocean, 
have actually found that based on the amount of plastic that we've put into the ocean, there's maybe only 1% that's actually floating on the surface mm. of the ocean. So we're missing 99% of yeah. that plastic and it's somewhere else. I think you've spoken to Richard Lampitt, yes. who's demonstrated with, uh, with Katsia Pavatsava here at, at the Oceanography Centre that a lot of that microplastics is actually floating around below the surface. Mm. What we started looking into was saying, well, where does it actually end up? Mm. More than 50% of plastic actually sinks naturally mm -hmm. um, and all sorts of other biological effects, kind of the snots that different <laughs> sorts of organisms in the ocean yeah. create can make that plastic sink. Yeah. So its ultimate fate, its ultimate resting place is presumably on the seafloor. Right. So we started thinking about, well, how can we investigate that mm. um, and and that that's really kind of what got me interested in microplastics is where do these bits go and in this case these bits are microplastics and not sand and mud yeah that's really interesting so um, as you said we did touch on that in our previous podcast uh, with Richard Lampitt um, how kind of only one percent of the plastic we can actually see which is on the yeah, surface yeah. but there's so much um, kind of throughout the water column and as you say on the sea floor so um Presumably, then, this plastic enters the ocean from, I guess, the main uh, sites would be from rivers, um, from boats and things like that. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So th th there's still a lot of debate and there's still a lot mm -hmm. of... Um, we still need more evidence. We yeah. need to do the stamp collecting, really, mm -hmm. to understand what the sources of plastics are. But it's th th this, this significant uh, evidence that it's rivers that transport a lot of plastics, mm -hmm. um, and particularly in areas where there's a lot of mismanaged plastic waste. Yeah. There are extremely big rivers, so areas in Southeast Asia, for yes, example, are, are, are disproportionately responsible for transporting plastics. But work that's been done here by colleagues at the, the Oceanography Centre has also demonstrated, exactly as you say, ships, but fishing. So in yeah. some areas of the ocean, say the Northeast Atlantic, uh, if you go to submarine canyons, and these are, imagine the Grand Canyon, but underwater. Mm. Um, if you go into the, the middle of these canyons, quite often what you find is snagged around cold water corals mm. that are there, is bits of fishing gear. Oh, wow, yeah. um, and in those places, the plastic could be 80, 90% mm. of the plastic that you find. Um, so it really depends on where you are, yeah. but it also depends on what processes are transporting that plastic. Mm. Until fairly recently, most studies have looked at how plastic gets transported across land mm -hmm. and, and to get to sea. So it, there's a river. Mm -hmm. They kind of stop there. And yeah. say, well, there's an arrow <laughs> that goes out and somewhere in the sea here be plastic. But where does it end up? Yeah. And presumably this is where we come in. Absolutely where we come <laughs> yeah. in. It's definitely. And, and so this is this is the bit that really got me going was was to say, well, we study these these currents that can happen on the sea floor. Mm. So there's currents on the surface of the ocean, there's currents in the water column. I study things, either avalanches of sediment that travel down submarine canyons that could be triggered by underwater landslides, or the global conveyor belt of currents, which are driven yeah. by changes in the temperature and salinity in different parts of the yeah. ocean. So we started thinking, well, can we go to places where you have the influence of these currents on the sea floor? And do we see differences in concentrations of the microplastics mm. on the sea floor? Yeah. Um, and that's very much what we found. So we, we went to um, the, the Tyrrhenian Sea, so mm -hmm. in, in the, uh, the Western Mediterranean. Oh, yeah, yeah. Went down to the deep sea there, far from shore, and found the biggest concentrations of microplastics anyone's ever found on the sea floor. Oh, wow. Um, and these conveyor belts are effectively sorting the plastic. So when the currents get too fast, they get sprayed along yeah. the seafloor. But next to those points, they're accumulating in, in, in what we call microplastic hotspots. Right. Um, and, and unfortunately, these are also the places where you get a lot of benthic biodiversity. So right. lots of uh, important but vulnerable organisms live mm. there because the same currents bring them oxygen. They mm. bring them the organic carbon yeah. that they like to eat. Yeah, exactly. And those... Those currents then, because at the surface, I mean, we kind of, we've all heard of some of the big currents like the Gulf Stream and things like yep. that. And we've heard of kind of that. I don't know how many of you have heard of that big story <laughs> of the um, the rubber ducks that got spilled off the ship. And still to this day, 20 years later, they're washing up on various yep, yep. beaches. They've gone global. Um, so the currents on the surface are normally quite fast. But I presume at on the sea or near the sea floor they're a bit more sluggish slower does it, it vary it varies significantly yeah. so deep, deep waters don't necessarily run still so mm -hmm. many places they can be quite slow but yeah. where where these these conveyor belts meet different types of, of sea floor character they can be funneled like when you put your thumb over the end of a hose pipe mm -hmm. it gets squirted out like a yeah. jet so it's very much what we found in the tyrrhenian sea 
Most of these currents are of the order kind of tens of centimetres per second, so you'd have okay. no, no problem really outrunning them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but other things that get funneled down submarine canyons, these, yeah. these avalanches of sediment called turbidity currents, mm. and the things that break cables as well, they, they can reach tens of metres per second. Wow. So this is the thing that you can't outrun if you happen to yeah. be in a submarine canyon at the yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. So, so how do they actually end up from from the surface and get down into the deep sea uh, how how long does that does that take i guess that varies as well yeah i mean it's, <laughs> it's a good question and i wish i had an answer yeah. for it really is is we what, what we do know is that plastics have been going into the ocean for decades mm. so we have a very long legacy of plastics yeah. and some people have started looking at different early types of plastics mm -hmm. and saying, well, can you work out the onset from looking at sediment cores that we take from the deep sea floor? You effectively have, when you open up your core, effectively a you know, book you can flick back through in time to see that's before plastics mm. and this is the start of plastics yeah. and, and this is how it's changing. But there's so much we don't know about how plastics age, mm. how they degrade. What we do know is that they have what we call an extremely long environmental residence mm. time. So they're very, very durable. Yeah. That, and that's one of the reasons why we love plastic, because it's a very useful material. Exactly, yeah. But at the same time, they can be in the ocean for a significant amount of time. They may even end up settling on the seafloor, and then another flow comes through and mm. whips them up again. Mm. Um, so we don't have an answer. Um, yeah. But we, we have some handle on the processes now that transport them from the shelf to the deep sea and across the deep sea. Mm. Um, but these are still only at a handful of sites. So we, we do need to make more observations mm -hmm. and actually go and sample the seafloor. Mm. We need to measure the currents um, that, are, that are actually transporting these microplastics. Mm. Um, and then we rely on models. Mm. So it's the models that allow us to upscale this to a global picture. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of question marks, which is a good thing from a researcher because it means there's lots of questions to answer, but also about exactly how microplastics behave. I've been studying sediments, so quartz, sand, and bits of clay and yeah. silt. We have a pretty good understanding of how those things behave. Uh, and so when a current interacts with them, we can, we can pretty much well guess where they're going to end up. Yeah. For microplastics, they're weird shapes, they're different densities, they can break up and become smaller. They can get eaten by organisms and then excreted out and then form these kind of agglomerations, kind of clumps of, uh, of, of microplastics and, and other stuff that the organism's eaten. Uh, and all these things change along its, its, its kind of pathway through the ocean. Mm. Um, and it involves every bit of the ocean. So it's, yeah. it's why it's an interesting problem to tackle mm. as well, because you need lots and lots of different people working on this. Yeah, no, I can imagine. Um, and I guess, well, this is a very active area of research, yeah. not just for you, but I guess for the NOC and for lots of other um, institutes around the world. But um, I'm quite interested in, so how do you actually go about studying this? Maybe you could give us an example from one of your recent studies about what you actually did to, to study this, um, especially using the observations and the yeah. models, if you like. Yeah, so I'll probably come back to the study in, in the Tyrrhenian Sea, so yeah. in the Western Mediterranean, this is an area where we actually, we've been working with collaborators in, in France from IFREMER and, mm -hmm. and other organisations who had previously uh, deployed current meters to make measurements of what uh, the, the bottom currents were doing and, and what the water masses are actually doing. They, from that, developed numerical models that, that allow us to understand exactly how the currents are working in that area. Um, we fortunately uh, acquired some sediment cores in an area that they had characterized very very well so we took a number of samples from from different types of seafloor um, mm. that the currents interact with differently um, and, and and basically look at those sediments and we separate out the microplastics mm -hmm. from the rest of the sediment uh, and then basically count the number of yeah. microplastics <laughs> we see we also look at the different types of microplastic mm -hmm. we see so so we use um, different bits of kit uh, things like an FTIR which basically gives us a chemical fingerprint of what the different types of plastics are so we can discern nylon from polyethylene and different types of plastic mm. um, and look at the concentrations and the types of microplastics relative to the different currents yeah um, that tells us where they end up yeah. tells us what the currents were doing. Yeah. It doesn't actually show us how they're being transported. Yeah. So other things that we've done in, in collaboration with, with colleagues at Utrecht University um, is, is using uh, what they call the Eurotank, but it's a, it's a huge uh, kind of like an aquarium mm -hmm. um, that we can put different things into. So here we've released lots of microplastics at the top of the tank and we let them run through one of these sediment avalanches and then we see where they end up. And, and we found some surprising things because... Microplastics quite often are very light, particularly the fibres, these things that can be blown to the top mm. of Mount Everest. Um, 
But those same fibers we're finding trapped right in the deposits at the bottom of these flows mm, that were are. running down the yeah. canyon. And it seems because of their shape, they actually get trapped between sand grains. And these avalanches naturally bury these microplastics. So they might actually be a force for good in this case. Mm. Whilst they break cables, they may also be just trapping and burying those microplastics, um, taking them out of yeah. um, the availability for organisms that might want might to munch on them. Yeah. <laughs> Have you done any research yourself or anyone in your team about the effect on organisms? Yeah, so Alice Horton, mm -hmm. who works as a part of the, uh, the microplastics research mm. group at, at the Oceanography Centre, is really focused very much on that. And so she's a world expert in mm. not just microplastics, but what we call kind of ecotoxicology. So yes. trying to understand the, the impacts. And in many cases, microplastics don't have an obvious impact on different organisms. And that's mm. because maybe the plastic themselves that's, that's inert and may not be that harmful. But mm. it's things that bind to the surface of microplastics, kind of toxic materials, I think, that Richard Lampitt will have talked yeah. about. Um, the, the question is, is how available those things are to different organisms uh, and, and the, the rates at which they, 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 they interact with them. A lot of laboratory experiments have exposed different organisms to very, very high concentrations to try and look at what the problem levels are. Mm. But that's not necessarily what's happening in the real world. Yeah. So Alice's work has been looking at kind of instantaneous impacts as well as prolonged but low level yeah. impacts. And it's probably fair to say that the jury's still out on that. Mm. We, we still need to gather more evidence and more data. Yeah. Um, but the two approaches go hand in hand. Yes. We're trying to understand how much of the stuff there is out there and where it ends up, which ecosystem, which part of the ecosystem does it actually interact with. Then mm. Alice's work very much picks up from there and says, well, what should we be worried about? Mm. What sorts of, of levels should uh, are going to be an issue? Mm. I guess there's, there's still so much more to do as this is kind of, I, wouldn't, I don't want to call it a new area of research, but it is kind of untapped, if you like. There's... Because if you're saying a lot of these microplastics are getting trapped in the kind of deep sea canyons, yeah. I can't imagine that we've studied all of them. <laughs> so there's probably still quite a lot to yeah, investigate. I, it, it's definitely reassuring for me as a researcher, but also frustrating <laughs> as well. So there, there's maybe 9,000 of these submarine canyons oh, wow. around the world. Mm. And they generally fall below the resolution of a lot of the ocean numerical models that we yeah. have. The flows that go through them, we don't fully understand the physics of them. And until maybe the last... 10 years or so, we had never made direct measurements of the flows that move through mm. these canyons. Uh, new technology has allowed us to do that, and that's mm. really exciting. But at the moment, we've maybe made measurements of flows in 10 canyons worldwide, and that's we as in the collective global yes. community <laughs> of researchers working on yeah. this issue. Um, but it is possible, and we are able to make those measurements, and, and they're finding all sorts of exciting things about how these flows potentially pose a hazard to seafloor infrastructure, but also what they carry. So things yeah. like microplastics, the organic mm -hmm. carbon that sustains yeah. deep sea uh, benthic communities. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I want to turn briefly to one of your latest pieces of research about the Congo canyons. Um, so I was reading, I was reading about this the other day, and it was. Um, so I think it finds that. Um, river floods essentially can cause lots of plastic to enter the deep sea and that's kind of a, that's a new finding yeah it is i mean we we know that rivers are one of the biggest agents for transporting sediment yeah. in, in, on, on the planet and now we also know that rivers are, can be quite important for transporting yeah. microplastics to the ocean so that's that's quite well understood. What happens beyond there? Mm -hmm. There's lots of question marks. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the, the Congo River is the, the second biggest river in the world mm. in terms of the water that it, it kind of spits out to the ocean. Um, offshore from that is one of the biggest submarine canyon systems on the planet that goes all the way down to five kilometers water depth mm, over wow. a distance of about 1500 kilometers mm. kind of a wiggly meandering channel that, mm. that ends up in, in what we call a submarine fan mm. that's the ultimate resting place for all the sediment that used to be in in the river we've never made detailed measurements um, of of a flow within such a big system from what we call source to sink so from mm. the head of the canyon down to the fan yes, exactly. um, but a recent NERC funded project that was led by Durham University that, that I contributed to uh, has made the first measurements mm. and we've been able to track a, a huge sediment avalanche that traveled 1200 kilometers down to wow. the deep sea 
reaching speeds of up to about eight meters per second. Oh, wow, that's pretty fast for the deep sea. And it was speeding up a thousand kilometers from the head of the canyon. Oh so y- y- I find those distances quite hard to, I know. to, to, <laughs> to fathom. But yeah. th- th- this flow was, was vast and, and we had deployed a number of different sensors along the canyon in the hope that maybe we'd, we'd record one or two smallish sort of events it, we previously thought that these sorts of flows maybe happened on hundreds or thousands of years time scale. Mm. Um, actually, within a few months of, of putting the instruments in, we started getting alerts from the instruments on the seafloor, and they were no longer on the seafloor. They were now floating up on the surface. And something had come through and had sequentially cut the uh, the, the connections wow. from all of these sensors to the seafloor and caused them to float to the surface. At the same time, we were also contacted by a couple of cable companies who have cables that mm. cross this canyon to say do you know anything about what's happening in the congo canyon yeah. <laughs> we, we've just lost internet connection oh interesting. and so the timings of all of these instruments coming up to the surface and the cable breaks told us about these flows but research that's currently ongoing with, with collaborators in plymouth and durham university is demonstrating that this flow also transported a huge amount of organic carbon and seems to have also transported a significant amount of microplastics with it. Mm. So these events are kind of flushing all the stuff that builds up within the canyon. These flows were were eroding and picking up loads of sediment, like a snow avalanche tearing all the way down to the deep sea. Yeah. Wow. So was was that just fortunate that you were kind of in the right place at the right time for this kind of event to happen? Or is it actually more frequent than... Ev- everywhere we seem to put instruments in submarine canyons, <laughs> we, we, we find something. I don't think we're doing it, but um, uh, it, it seems like canyons in particular and much of the deep sea is actually far more active and vigorous um, mm. than we had previously thought. Yeah. And this is because we've had to study, this is where I come from as a geologist, we, we look at sediment cores, yeah. we look at the deposits they leave behind, but it, it's a very incomplete record because mm-hmm. these flows can erode the seafloor, mm. they can rework those deposits. So... Um, we were probably out by, you know, our understanding of how frequent and powerful these flows were um, is is being corrected now by the observations yeah. that, that we're making. Um, that is fascinating. My mind is kind of blown a little bit because all of my research is, well, most of my research kind of focuses on the kind of upper ocean, so yeah, near the yeah. surface. And I've my perspective was always that it was kind of sluggish on, on the seafloor, but actually, no, perhaps not no, everywhere. I mean, for a large part of the ocean, I'm sure that holds true. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, but it, it's certainly interesting. A lot of the, the studies of microplastics that have looked at the accumulations on the surface, mm. when asking, well, where does it end up? They've assumed mm. it settles vertically out mm. through the water column. And, and the research that we're doing that Richard Katzia is doing yeah. here at NOC is demonstrating that ocean currents play a really important mm. role. And we shouldn't be surprised by this. It's actually very intuitive. In the same way as microplastics get blown in the wind, yes, of, course, of course, even weak currents can play yeah, a, a, an absolutely. important control on them. Yeah. And how do, how do models come into all this? How do they help? I, well, I hope they do help. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we do. <laughs> Um, so models allow us to then translate the observations that, that we have at a few point locations to, to, to look at this over a bigger picture. It clearly needs calibration, so it needs that course, stamp yeah. collecting. Um, I think fairly recently a lot of the literature around microplastics on the seafloor was there's this much here, there's this much here, mm-hmm. there's that much there. Mm-hmm. That's useful, but in and of itself, it doesn't take us a step further. Yeah. So we need the contextual information that goes with it. What are the currents that operate in those sorts of areas? And models allow us to fill in the gaps between observational points. Of course, yeah. But they are imperfect, and they're imperfect also because we don't fully understand the behavior of microplastics. Yeah, so of if you change the shape, the density yeah. of the microplastics, it will behave differently in the model. Um, so again, as I said, it's exciting because it means there's lots of experiments to be done. There's mm. there's lots of observations to, mm. to make. Um, and then it links into, to say, work that Alice Horton does yes. here as well of well, also what do we care about? We could yes. work back from that. So which types of microplastics are we most concerned about mm. and how do they get transported? Mm. Can we link their kind of ultimate resting point to the sources yeah. and track that pollution pathway? Mm. Yeah, I understand. So I think... Um, some of the work you've talked about already is kind of talking about those canyons that are kind of fairly close to the land, yeah. kind of attached, as we call them. Yeah. Have you done anything, any work on um, detached canyons, as in land-detached canyons? Yeah. Um, it, does it look any different from those close to the kind of source of the plastics? Or 
Yeah, so this is something I've, I've been really interested in recently, and, we, and yeah. we've had uh, we've been part of a, a program called CLASS here, which mm-hmm. is um, uh, Natural Environment Research Council funded large project studying the North Atlantic. And one of the canyons in the Northeast Atlantic is called the Whitard Canyon. Yes. It's it's the UK's only submarine canyon, <laughs> so it gives us it gives me a good excuse to study submarine <laughs> canyons. And other colleagues like Villa Huvena mm. here at NIC have mm. have been studying that canyon for for a long time, and and it's important because it's, it's got it's teeming with life. Yeah. Um, I was less excited by this canyon because most of the canyons we have been studying recently that I get quite excited by either connect directly to rivers like mm-hmm. the Congo Canyon mm-hmm. or they're fed by a longshore drift. Yes. So there's a canyon offshore California called the Monterey Canyon. Mm-hmm. And there you can throw a beach from shore and you could land a stone in the head of the canyon. Yeah. So it's quite obvious how this links from land to yes, the deep exactly. sea. In the Whitard Canyon, the head of the canyon lies more than 200 kilometers from the nearest mm-hmm. bit of land. And, and so it's thought, it, or at least it has been thought until fairly recently, that these sorts of canyons only feature turbidity currents, these avalanches of sediment, um, when sea levels are much lower. So that would be about 20,000 years ago right. um, during the, the last glaciation. Um, we put some instruments and some sensors down in the canyon, and I didn't expect to find anything very interesting. And, and then we pulled them out after a year, and found that the frequency of these turbidity currents is about the same as in the Congo Canyon and in Monterey Canyon, these systems that are directly oh, wow. connected to land. And they reach speeds of eight meters per second. Mm. Uh, this is the same speed and intensity that we see in other systems. And it didn't make any sense to us. Like, how would you get these flows? What's triggering them? But we also see them transporting litter. So our moorings that we deployed with the sensors on them, around the mooring la- anchors and lines, we found lots of fishing gear, other bits of litter and plastic. So these flows are definitely transporting plastic. Mm. We, we're running analysis at University of Manchester with, with collaborators there um, to see how much microplastics that they're transporting. But they, they clearly are doing that based on preliminary results. Um, but these these canyons represent maybe three quarters of all of the submarine canyons worldwide. Oh, OK. Uh, and so we now think that potentially we've really underestimated mm. the role of these canyons in connecting continental shelves, so yeah. shallow water, all the way down to the deep sea. And this is maybe a, a missing kind of connection that we, we hadn't previously thought operated in the present day. Yeah. Well, that's really fascinating. So still so much to do. So much to do, yeah. <laughs> Which is good for you, I guess. <laughs> Um, so all of this research is obviously really important um, and we touched on it lightly at the beginning, but I was wondering what kind of impact it has on society. Yeah, and it, it, it's a good question. I mean, in part, these plastics are really useful kind of tracers. So I, I'm really interested in if we can see how these plastics get transported. It helps us understand the currents that transport them that also pose mm-hmm. hazards in a really similar way to you know, th- there's often sometimes positive outcomes from, from bad events. So yeah. the, the Deepwater Horizon incident in the Gulf of Mexico right, yeah. released a huge amount of oil that floated on the surface of the ocean. But using satellite images, oceanographers have been able to reconstruct the, the currents, the loop currents that mm. operate there, based on how oil gets transported. So one way is just better understanding the, the, the hazards. But in, in reality, I think when we think about plastics in the ocean i think when most people think about plastics in the ocean they think about these floating Mm. garbage patches they they think about very charismatic animals with bits of plastic Mm. around their necks that's important but also understanding where else plastic goes in the ocean um, and where it's coming from we whatever happens we've got decades of legacy plastic waste that we're not going to be able to do much about Mm. but we can start to change our behavior and i think by getting an understanding of where stuff is coming from you know um what the sources are for this this plastic if we can start tracking it back to the source then it means you can more meaningfully mitigate that you can start Mm. to address it in in an appropriate manner at the moment we kind of say well there's an awful lot of plastic in the ocean Um, we think it comes from all sorts of different places we think it gets transported by these different manners if we get a better understanding from from its source to its end point we can do something you know and it's about turning that tap off rather than than mopping up up the ocean absolutely Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I've certainly (laughs) learned a lot. Um, So to keep up to date with the microplastics team, head over to our website, knock.ac.uk, and follow us across social media. If you're enjoying Into the Blue, you can show your support by subscribing on your favourite podcast app, leaving us a rating and telling your friends and family all about us.